Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. Sadly, still wrapped in a pandemic. There's uh, several billion people with a B still not vaccinated once on earth. Um, we all are, people like me feel very privileged. I just have my second booster. So I've been, sh I have four shots. Um, we're on an overheating planet, you know, global warming is underway, well underway and the changes in the earth system that humans are are under are, are driving are profound uh, ecologically everything around us is transformed from where it was 100 years ago uh, the Hudson River where Chris Bowser is standing right now in one of the creeks leading into the Hudson River is is a river that you know the elders who I interviewed for the New York Times back in the 90s uh, with when there was shad bountiful shad in the 60s even up until then and um, would, would bemoan the state of the river right now, but it's a living river and there's so much that can be done to make it even more vibrant and dynamic. And today is a day devoted to eels, a species that a lot of us, you know, many, most Americans have probably never seen an eel. I living near rivers, I've caught them, seen them. They're kind of gross, they're, but they're beautiful and wondrous in their, their life cycle. They, they span the Atlantic. They're mysterious. We still don't know many things about them. And every year around this time, up and down the Hudson and other uh, in the Delaware River and many other places, biologists, students, teachers get down into the water and uh, start to uh, deploy nets and seines to check on the status of this species, which is really an underpinning of uh, an ecosystem. So Chris Bowser from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, how are you? I feel fantastic, Andy. Thank you so much for uh, putting this up. I, I probably don't have to scream at the camera. Thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, and we are really happy to come to you today from uh, Black Creek. This is a tributary to the Hudson River Estuary, uh, about, about 85 to 90 miles north of New York City. Uh, so we're north of Poughkeepsie. We're in Ulster County, not too far from Kingston, New York. And we are surrounded by a, a one of my favorite tributaries, a tributary being, being a, um, a smaller stream that feeds into a larger river. So Black Creek is a tributary to the Hudson River. In fact, you, you could follow this tributary, this creek right on down, and only in about 300 yards, boom, you'd be out in the big open Hudson River estuary. We can, we can talk about what that means in a minute. This is one of my favorite locations because this is a this is a uh, thanks to the the great work of, of scenic Hudson, this is a this is a um, sort of what a natural tributary should look like. You'll see lots of branches, rocks, logs. It's a little messy. It's 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 not groomed here, but that's perfect for the herring, the the suckers, and the American eels. All three of which are migrating this time of year into this tributary at some point in their life cycle. So this is an A1 spot to observe some real life migrations that are happening. This isn't this isn't like a textbook. This isn't this isn't a live streaming on TV. This is actually happening here and now. That's fantastic. I just uh, I'm thrilled. I just wish I was there standing in the water with waders with you. Um, and we, right now with us, we have Patrick Jones, who's one of your volunteers in this program, who is one of my longtime musician friends from the Hudson Valley, home Hello. in Deacon today. And he has a bio biology degree and he represents, uh, you know, it's wonderful we have this education system in which he circled back to get his biology degree uh, late in his, later in life. You know, he's a middle-aged guy like me and he's, it's great to have him out there. And Nicole Friedman, from the other coast of this country, uh, who is uh, with the World Fish Migration Foundation. And uh, I'm gonna show a slide or two from them in a minute, but uh, basically their mission is saving free, restoring and saving free flowing rivers full of fish. And I can't, you know, if I could think of one thing I would love along the coasts of our country and around the world, it's that same thing. Uh, there's been great depletion. There's so much promise and restorative potential out there. 
Uh, Nicole, could you just give a thumbnail sketch and say hi from where are you? In, you're in California? Hello. Yeah, I am just north of San Francisco right now. I'm here just for a week visiting family, but it's so nice to be back over here. That's great. Yeah. And and, and tell, tell us uh, just for another, you know, quick sketch of this project that you're involved with, with the foundation and what, what your work is. Yeah, absolutely. So the World Fish Migration Foundation is where we're a small environmental nonprofit. We're actually based in the Netherlands, but our work extends mm. globally. Um, and we basically have three key missions. One of them is connection, connecting people and organizations with each other, um, and as well as connecting people with fish and rivers. Uh, also sharing knowledge and tools um, to help save fish and rivers and raising awareness. So we do this through two of our main projects, which are Dam Removal Europe, which focuses mostly on removing the over 150,000 obsolete barriers that are littering rivers and streams throughout Europe. But we also you know, work with people in the US and around the world to kind of help uh, connect practitioners um, in mm -hmm. dam removal and help people understand how to remove dams. And our other project is World Fish Migration Day, which is a fun uh, celebration every two years where organizations um, host their own events that connect fish, rivers, and people. We host fun contests. We um, have seminars. People do marches and, and things like what Chris is doing out there, citizen science. So we kind of go from top to bottom to get people to connect with each other, fish, and rivers. And I noticed this one in Ukraine, which, of course, we're all thinking about Ukraine literally yeah. every day these days. So they've done quite a bit of this, it looks like. They have, yeah. These I um, I found these projects really amazing. Over just two years, they managed to remove um, five barriers in the Carpathian Mountains of Ukraine, mm. and that opened up 400 kilometers of river, um, which was really an incredible project. And actually, these barriers had been obsolete for over 50 years. So it shows that you know there are all these things that are they basically only serve to block fish from reaching their spawning grounds, and we just need will tools and money to get them out that's great yeah this in in maine they've uh, been uh, undamming some streams uh, yeah. we're, we're working on it here and there and uh, it's not always a conflict with uh, hydros as you say some of these are just old dams that structures that don't really serve a purpose exactly i think that's something a lot of people don't realize too is like why are we removing dams is it this big radical thing and it's really not and we actually have found that dam removal is the fastest, most effective way to bring back fish populations and restore ecosystems, which, and it isn't just for fish too, you know, once the fish are back and the river is healthy, we get birds, bugs, plants, like it restores the whole ecosystem. And that can be done by removing dams and um, it's happening, the movement is building, so. Wow. Yeah. So back to the Hudson River, where a couple of dams we have upriver had been removed, but our focus again is gonna be on this, the eel. So uh, Chris, can you kind of take us through your work yeah, let me give you, a, I want to give you a rundown of a couple things. Yeah. First, I want to give you a rundown of eels, and then I want to give you a rundown of the Eel Project, which is a wonderful program from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation in strong partnership with Cornell University's Water Resource Institute and dozens of other organizations. So first the eels, then the Eel Project. The right. net behind me, you can kind of see over my shoulder, this cone-shaped fike net. It's not very big, but every night it is catching what we call glass eels. And if you look inside this jar, Amazing. you can see wiggling around <laughs> some two-inch, almost transparent animals. These are American eels and Guila Restrada. Many people are familiar with eels. Some people are familiar with eels because they uh, catch them on their hook and line. And like you referred to earlier, Andy, they're not very happy about it. Many people right. think of eels as slimy snake-like fish. Some people are familiar with eels because they've eaten them. Um, right. Some people are familiar with eels because they may have read some of the weird, interesting things about them, like the fact that these animals right here in this jar, which were just which were which were just caught, yeah, here in the Hudson River, hatched a year ago, probably in the Atlantic Ocean 
likely in what's called the Sargasso Sea, this big area of water roughly between Bermuda and Puerto Rico. And by the way, a lot of things with eobiology are going to be to our best guess, we think. There's right. a lot of mysteries when it comes to eels. There's a lot of, of questions to be answered when it comes to eels. I'm showing a, I'm showing a couple of slides from your uh, the DEC's deck here that, that make that point about the Sargasso Sea. It's amazing. Beautiful. And in fact, the uh, the image you have on there now is uh, is again this uh, that's the leptocephali. That's um that's the ocean going purely salt water kind of larval form of the eels. Amazing. Then as they approach coasts uh, like New York coasts, they transform into these glass eels. This is the form of eel that is making that transition from salt water to fresh water. It's not a different species. It's a different life stage of the same eel, not the same species of eel. Um, they'll come into different estuaries like the Hudson. So the, 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 I, I used the word estuary before. So one of the neat things about the Hudson River between Albany and New York City is that it's a tidal estuary. Uh, that means that there's a mix of salt water from the ocean with fresh water from the watershed uh, that mixes, that mingles. And in fact, even behind me, we have a tidal influence. Even here, almost 100 miles from New York City, yeah. we still have about a three to four foot difference between low tide and high tide. Right. So that estuary is very, very important. And I, um, that reminds me, I, I want to mention that where we are right now, this is the, the homeland of the Stockbridge Munsee Band of Mohicans. Right. And the, the name of the Hudson River in Munsee is Mahikanituk, which means the waters that are never still. And I think that is a beautiful reminder of the Hudson River as this dynamic ecosystem. And it also uh, pertains to the eels themselves, which are moving throughout their life cycle. Yeah. You've got, Andy, you've got a slightly older eel there. And in fact, in this jar, in this little fishbowl, you can see what is, I would call this maybe a, an older elver or a yellow hmm. eel. So this, is, a, this yeah. is an animal, same thing as that glass eel, but it's probably maybe two or three years older than those glass eels that we were just looking at. So Amazing. this is a slightly older animal. And these this eel may stay in this system for 10, 20, or more years, Incredible. eventually attaining a size of two or three or four feet long. And then as this adult make its way back to the ocean, presumably to the Sargasso Sea, to spawn once and die. And that is the, the sort of, 10 to 20 year life cycle of the eel that covers literally thousands of miles and everything on the salt gradient from completely freshwater creeks and streams to full on Atlantic Ocean salinity. It is one of the most amazing uh, migrations in the world. And, and, and it happens under millions of people's uh, 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 noses all the time. Incredible. Um, so that's that's the kind of biology part of the eel. I'll I'll pause there for a second. There's Any, a question, actually. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Carol San Stanford has uh, from YouTube said, "Did I understand that we don't know how they propagate?" So, I think that that's that's a yeah. I think that's actually a pretty fair statement. Um, there is so much about eel reproduction that we just don't know. We've never seen it happen. We, we have found silver eels, adult, the, the, the adult form of the eel that's ready to spawn is called a silver eel. And they have been caught and trapped in the ocean heading towards what we call the Sargasso Sea. We've also found tiny little baby leptocephali that are only days old. So we have a, 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 a guesswork where they're hatched. We've right. never seen it happen. We don't know what that mating behavior is truly like. And it's something that we're honestly pretty much unable to replicate in a lab. So it's not like eels are aquacultured from generation to generation. There is something about the, 
the special the specialness of the Sargasso Sea or the specialness of the Atlantic and the eel's relationship with it that we can't replicate and we don't know. The mystery is still huge. And the other the other profound reality is uh, population decline, right? So that's the next thing I wanted to get into. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. And when people ask, you know, okay, so the last hundred years have not been great for eel populations worldwide. Uh, that includes the Japanese eel, Anguilla japonica, the European eel, Anguilla anguilla, and our own American eel, Anguilla ristrata. Uh, these populations have had a rough century. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, over harvesting so we could eat them is absolutely one factor, but not the only factor. Climate change, habitat loss, parasitism, um, all of these are contributing factors. And this is where really where the where the World Fish Migration Foundation comes in. The damming uh, uh, and, and I I implementing of barriers into these streams that they're migrating to has definitely had an effect. Even though eels can climb out of the water, even though we've literally seen eels climbing up concrete walls, every single dam or every single <laughs> poorly sized culvert is a barrier, is a filter, is something that is going to contribute to that decline in American eels, which thankfully is where groups like World Fish Migration Day come in and it's where projects like New York State's Hudson River Eel Project behind me also come in. So when you're ready, we're gonna switch from eel biology to eel conservation and communities. Let's, uh, let's go there. I love it. So as you'll see right here, what we've got, we're gonna, hey everybody, we're on now, we're on a live stream. Hey. What we, what we have right here Amazing. is great volunteers. And these volunteers, by the way, are, are coming from all over the place. Some of them are staff that work for the DEC in Cornell, like myself. Some of them are from uh, a local school. What school are you guys from? Highland Elementary. Highland Elementary School. Fantastic. We also got some people here from local colleges. Neek, where are you coming from? Bard College is representing here. Fantastic. We've got, uh, we got people from all over. What these volunteers are doing is they're checking the eels that were caught in this net. You can sort of see this funnel-shaped spike net. And if you notice, we have it very much against this edge of the stream here. The idea is that last night, glass eels, which love to travel at night at high tide, we're coming up this creek. Now, we didn't catch all of the glass eels, by the way. Our net's only, only about 12 feet wide. But some of those eels came up the creek and into our net. <laughs> These volunteers opened up this trap. You can see this is our trap right here that the eels come into. It's underwater. They're in a nice, safe place. They've got nothing to worry about. And Ben and Neek and Leah and all of these great students yeah. took the eels out of this net and are now in the middle of counting them. So you can actually see. You want to pick up a few in your net there so we can take a look at them in your net? Yeah, scoop up some for us. So you can actually... You can actually see some of these. Hold this in your hand for me. Yeah. You can actually see a bunch of these eels. I don't know. Can you see? Yeah, they're there. Oh, totally. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So you can see these are glass eels Amazing. from Mahikani Took. The waters Amazing. that are never still and neither are the eels. They are in their migration right now. Incredible. So now the next thing that comes into play is, all right, great. We caught a bunch of eels. Now what do we do with them? So we're, we're doing a couple things. One, we're doing a count so that we can get a census of eels uh, that, are ha that are coming into the, to this creek right now. And we're doing this every day for about eight weeks each spring. This is year 15 that we've done this project. So we're getting a good data set of eels. But not only are we doing these daily censuses, but these eels that we catch we are going to put back in the creek, but not where we caught them. We're going to very deliberately 
take them above the closest barrier, the closest dam, culvert, road crossing, something that even if it didn't yeah. stop them would slow them down. We're going to give these eels a little, a, a, a little assist. That mm -hmm. way also we won't catch them again and they can continue on with their journey. So and, we've got, yeah, go ahead. And this is happening all up and down the river, right? The, the sampling and stuff. Yes. The cool thing about this project uh, is that this is happening at over a dozen sites from Staten Island to Albany and Troy. So we have teams of volunteers that are doing this project. One of the things I love about this project is that it is extremely accessible. Okay, we're here. We're here at this site at Black Creek, which is uh, which is this beautiful park that is that is is protected and natural. Uh, but you do have to drive to get here. You do have to put a little effort to get here. We have other eel sites, the same techniques, the same gear, the same purpose that are literally in downtown areas like Poughkeepsie and Newburgh, where we have volunteers that can actually walk to the sites. So we're able to also look at eels in rural areas, eels in urban areas, eels in brackish, freshwater. We're able to look at eels at a whole different array of sites, and we're able to invite hundreds of different volunteers that live in all of these different areas from all sorts of different backgrounds are all contributing to this community science project. It's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Hey, Patrick Jones there back in Beacon, New York. Uh, you've been yes. uh, on some of these eel uh, surveys. Uh, can you give a quick uh, sense of your take on it? Well, uh, I wanted to say that um, that uh, in addition to Chris, uh, which is just amazing, uh, you know, I, I, I love that guy. I mean, your enthusiasm about the project is just so inspiring for me, brother. So uh, I wanted to say that, you know, uh, the eels, what you get up here in terms of eels, they don't propagate up here. They propagate down to in, in the Sargasso. So these numbers are really important that we understand what's happening because what you see is what you get pretty much. And the name of that is called catadromus. Salmon actually do the opposite. Salmon uh, go downstream, I, I mean, come upstream and spawn. Eels yeah. do the opposite. They spawn into the sea. Hey, hold on one second. I want to hear from a couple of these, uh, are these teachers or volunteers or students or parents. Well, that's that's what we're gonna find out. We're gonna we're gonna meet a couple of people here. Could you introduce yourself and just tell us why are you doing this project? <laughs> Hi, I'm Meek. I'm a student at Bard College, and I'm doing this. I care about our local ecosystem, and eels are a very essential part of that. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Here go here here at Bard. I just uh, did a project with Bard, uh, the climate. Uh, oh, uh, I was te there. teaching. I yeah, I was there. Yeah. Uh, what Great. lecture were you doing? Oh well, I ran I ran one of the webcasts uh, just uh, about the process. Yeah, it was really cool. It was a really great event. Um, Jen Metzger was there. So much great speakers. It was really fun. Yeah. So who else is with you there? So we well, can you introduce yourself? Hi, hi, I'm Leah Harris. I'm a teacher here in Highland Middle School. And, and Leah, why do you why did you go through all of the trouble after school to bring a bunch of students and teachers down here? What the heck is that? About? Um, so I've been hanging out with eels for a number of years, and I think it is one of the most amazing migration stories we have here in the Hudson Valley. Um, and to see these creatures that are see-through and um, by the thousands coming through our waters, is a, it's kind of a mir miraculous event because you would never know that they are here otherwise. So I think it's a, it's a fabulous thing to do, and I, I do it every year. So It's great. And, I, you know, I've been involved with a couple of, projects back at the New York Times a long time ago, I wrote about trout in the classroom, yeah. which is a program where students raise a thing, a bit, you know, hatchling trout and then release them up in the watershed. Uh, there's something special about getting to know a fish through its life cycles, I think, that really pulls students in. I don't know if that's true for your students. I hope so. Um, I haven't <laughs> talked to the ones that are here yet, but I, I will check in with them when we're done. So yeah. yeah. That's great. I should also add, this brings up a good point, is that if anybody's interested, so 
the uh, the the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, particularly the Hudson River Estuary Program and the Research Reserve, um, have some great eel-related teaching resources online. And I know you're probably thinking to yourself, you mean eel-related teaching resources? <laughs> We've got some great Hudson River curriculum units, um, and you should check that out. And also, one of our founding partners is the uh, Cornell University's Water Resource Institute. And we have a virtual river uh, website on, uh, on, with them that has a whole bunch of really cool short videos with sort of curated lesson plans. Some of them have to do with eels, but they have to do with all sorts of other issues from watersheds to climate change to sturgeon to you name it. So the DEC and Cornell, we're, we're really trying to, A, you know, get a handle on what's going on with our, our national treasures. Uh, but also, we're trying to put those natural resources in the hands of people who can volunteer and, and give us some time, but also put those, uh, those natural resources in the hands and minds of students in classrooms um, uh, yeah. up and down the valley and really throughout the world. That's just great. I'm going to show the website for folks just so they can see it. And I have up there the um, eel project at dec.ny.gov is a, is a uh, an email to get in touch. And here's the uh, teaching resources. Uh, yeah, you can see that. And this all gets um, you know archived so people can go back and write down what they see as well. Fantastic. Absolutely. So maybe you could focus in a little bit closer to the activities there, just so uh, people watching can see a little bit more of what the students are doing and the like. That'd be great. Sure. So what we have right here is Nick and Ben, and hopefully you can you can see that okay. Yep, yep. They're looks actually great. taking a subset of 20 eels, 20 glass eels, and we're going to weigh those 20 eels. It's very difficult to weigh things out in the field uh, that, that it would be so light as one individual eel. So instead, we weigh them in aggregate like this. And we've got here that 20 glass eels weigh 3.09 grams. That's another piece of data set that we take. Um, what's kind of interesting from the scientific end is that sometimes throughout the season, we may actually see glass eel weights come down a little bit. So the, in, in other words, we're either the eels are shrinking or we're catching smaller eels later in the season. And if you think at first you think, well, that's strange because they should be older and bigger, but it might be a little bit different. This might be sort of a marathon effect where mm -hmm. the biggest, strongest glass eels are arriving earliest. And as the season goes on, these smaller eels that have taken a little bit of extra time uh, uh, are catching up. The other thing that I think is really important to note is that this is a really strange migration. This animal is only two inches long and it's traveling thousands of miles. And it's going through a lot of physiological changes right now from, from saltwater to freshwater creature. So it, it may not be capitalizing on food sources yet as it's making that transition, but as it gets more comfortable and acclimated to a new ecosystem, new food sources, new temperatures, new salinities. Those glass eels, as they transfer into elvers, will become ravenous predators and they'll be eating lots of little plankton and invertebrates that they find throughout the ecosystem. That's so great. Um, I want to uh, turn back to um, uh, the World Fish Migration Foundation briefly. And Nicole, uh, what what else what else is going on around the world that has uh, this kind of quality to it? What are you seeing here? Oh man, there's so many things that are going on. Uh, one of the really fun things that we've been seeing that's kind of been getting a lot of kids involved um, in fish and and all you know just kind of getting excited about this topic is the fish flag contest. Um, we've actually there's a few pictures on one of the slides that I that I uh, made, but. Oh. Um, we've, yeah, kids around the world, a lot of classrooms around the world have been making flags um, of their favorite wow. migratory fish species. And a lot of teachers have been using that as an opportunity to get kids excited about art, fish, uh, you know, teaching them about what's going on here. Um, yeah. I'll go back to that, the slides right now. Hold Fantastic. And uh, let's see here. I believe it's the last slide. 
You know, Nicole brings up some go. really good points. Is is we've been concentrating on eels, but it's really important to remember that eels are just one part of the ecosystem. Uh, right. It, for eels to thrive, we need so many other parts of that ecosystem. Uh, we need uh, uh, trees along tributaries and vegetation to keep to keep shorelines intact. We need communities that are resilient to climate change and that that are that are going to be livable alternatives along our, our our estuaries. And we need we need animals these migratory animals like eels. They need all parts of the world to be intact, which is one of the reasons why I and the DEC and Cornell, we love partnering with World Fish Migration Day. And uh, I just think the work that Nicole is doing is totally, totally awesome <laughs> and essential, not just for eels, but for everybody. Totally. Thanks, Chris. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. we love working with Chris, too. <laughs> Well, you made the key point about you know the, these fish uh, are in the ocean, they're in they're in the river, uh, it's all interrelated, and it, it, the shad is another classic example of a fish. If you just focus on them in the river, you're missing all the issues that affect the future of shad too. It's everyone has to understand it's a systems thinking thing, and uh, which I think is great in terms of education as well. Well. Um, You've been holding that camera out for a while, and I don't want to take you, keep you away. The sun is starting to fade there. But if you have any last, uh, any last little tidbit to show, that would be cool. If any, I don't know if the students want to say hi. or. Um, but uh, well, First of all, everybody loves to see some eels. Yes, let's see, let's see those little glass eels a little more. Yeah. So they've been across a big chunk of the Atlantic Ocean to get into that jar temporarily. Oh, oh! Within when I when I hang up the phone, uh, we'll 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 get these up and back in the water. Fear yeah. not. Um, right. And uh, I want to just give another just another special hello and thank you to the Stockbridge Munsee community. Uh, yeah. I've I've learned so much from them about uh, Mahikani Took the the waters that are never still, and it's such like a great thing to remember about our ecosystem. And um, uh, just if anybody wants to learn more about uh, eels or the Hudson River in general, please just check out the DEC's website. There's a lot of different resources. You don't have to be into eels. You can be into lots of other things. Uh, sure. but please check that out. And then the last thing, I will I want to turn it back to Nicole. Nicole, can you just mention May 21st? Oh, yeah. Uh, so the best event of every two years is happening this May. So World Fish Migration Day, which I mentioned earlier, is on May 21st, 2022. So this year in, uh, wow, a month from yesterday, um, we already have over 250 events around the world. You can find an event near you or even host your own. Um, if you go to worldfishmigrationday.com slash events, um, right. you will find things like what Chris is doing, working in rivers. You can find conferences, webinars. Um, you can also join us for a live event that's coming up on May 21st, where we're going to have people singing songs about fish. We'll learn the winners of some of our fish art contests, and we'll connect with events from around the world. So May 21st, 2022, you have to be there. Well, I guarantee I'll be there one way or the other. Maybe Woo! we can do, I don't want to uh, do it simultaneous to the one you're doing, but maybe we could do something on here as well to build, a, to build that conversation. This is just great. And you you mentioned the Native American history. And Patrick Jones, you have a Native American background. And I don't know, when you think about restoration of these ecosystems, Patrick, uh, how does it relate to your heritage and the restoration of that as well? Oh, you're muted. So you're muted. Uh, sorry, I was trying to be <laughs> have some good adequate. It's very strong uh, in... My your cam your camera turned off. Oh, sorry. That's okay. There we go. I get this right. It's it's very strong in my belief system. I uh, get the full support of the Cherokee people that I am in a circle with in doing this because it's very very um, important to really put hands on and to be in touch with the earth that we've done so for thousands of years. I also want to quickly say, Andy, you always say you're in Len Lenape territory yeah, on all shows, and I, and, and I tell people about that and they do know about it. 
Um, it's uh, also a big thing for me to go back to school and get my degree in biology. And this is a great avenue for me to use it um, right. to help people and, and to uh, educate people in this. It's, uh, it's a very uplifting thing. And it's also a great thing to be part of Chris's organization. He's just, uh, you can see his ebullience and his uh, enthusiasm yeah. and touching and reaching so many people. It's a very inspiring to be a part of that. So thank you. Well, it's inspiring to help tell this, to tell, just convey the story here through my yeah. Sustain What webcast. So yeah. Chris, Chris, uh, Nicole, uh, let's call it a day. You, you, you've got work there just to kind of get done with the end of your, your day in the field. And um, let's revisit, okay? There, I, I was out uh, with DEC years ago uh, measuring the, the, the wonderful Atlantic sturgeon that are coming back into the river. Uh, there was a 14-footer that was seen on, on uh, sonar. And it's a wonderful thing to see the, uh, the, the capacity of nature to mm. resurge, to, to pull yeah. forward. There's that great yeah. sticker. Yeah. yeah uh, that, they're, they're out there right now, too, as well as the striped, striped bass and, and the, the rest. I, yeah, I wanted to quickly say that the stripers are starting to spawn. And if you could get out into the Hudson or along the shore on a very quiet morning, you'll see what looks like a huge swirl of fins. Mm -hmm. And it looks like a big whirlpool of salmon, uh, male and female, depositing their eggs in the male, uh, not salmon, but uh, striped bass running over them. So. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. This is the Columbia Climate School, Sustain What webcast. I'm Andy Revkin. And this is uh, has been a wonderful way to share a little bit of Earth Day action in the river, in the stream. Chris, you're... Andy, yeah. I want to say, I thank you. You yeah. wrapped up exactly. I want to say happy Earth Day. And I wanted to say thank you to everybody out there, all your listeners who are doing what they can, small, medium, and large, to help out their environment and, and just be a part of solutions. So thank you, everybody, for whatever way you're a part of solutions. Keep up the good work. This is Bowser from the DEC reporting from Black Creek on the Hudson River. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Have a good evening, and uh, we'll be back in touch. All right. that's, that's a wrap for Earth Day on Sustain What.